All right. Hello, everyone. In this research review, we're going to discuss a recent article that was published that I think is really interesting and has a lot of practical applications that we can pull from it. So in general, the, the focus of this article is the concept of training to failure. And I will say before we get into the article itself, training to failure is the, the term or the definition of is kind of self-explanatory, right? So within kind of a, a weight room type setting, training to failure typically means literally doing as many repetitions as you can, right? At the end of that set, you should be taxed, um, literally not able to do one more rep. That would be the true definition of failure. However, a lot of people tend to underestimate their proximity to failure, meaning they stop um, thinking that they can't do any more when in reality, if they truly were pushed uh, to crank out a few more reps, they probably could, uh, especially in newer trainees. Uh, again, they just tend to underestimate this for whatever reason. So again, just kind of take that um, into consideration here as we discuss this article in particular. So brief background here that the authors get into. Actually, let me let me back up a second. So the title of the study, again, this is one that was recently published. So the effects of resistance training to near failure on strength, hypertrophy and motor unit adaptations in resistance trained adults. Okay, so these were uh, previously trained individuals, pretty strong. Uh, we'll get into the description of the, the subject group here in a second. But Again, kind of broadly, the, the scope of this study was set up in a way to determine if it's more beneficial to train to failure compared to not training to failure. Okay, and, and kind of the background that the authors got into here was just kind of discussing the, the kind of underlying notion that there seems to be this pre preconceived notion that training to failure is essential for eliciting kind of training adaptations over time. And the thought was, especially in trained individuals, that they just always needed to train to failure in order to get bigger and stronger. Uh, and I see this a lot in particularly younger athletes where they think they always need to go full throttle in the weight room every single day. Again, taking every set to failure uh, for every single lift that they're doing. And while I admire their their dedication and grit, it, it's really kind of misplaced when we look at that effort. And so in my opinion, I think they should just redirect that effort into just putting more weight on the bar or lifting heavier for each set and then not necessarily taking every single one to failure for every set, for every lift, for every day that they're in the weight room. Right. And that kind of comes down to experience. But then also, this is where the strength coach needs to educate them on there's kind of a time and a place uh, to really take some of these sets to failure. And as long as it's part of a well structured plan, uh, it again can be beneficial in certain situations. So, what they did or what, what the purpose of the study was again to investigate whether five weeks of resistance training near failure. So, that would mean again, zero reps left or maybe one reps left in the tank. Um, and this is what the authors define as low repetitions in reserve training, meaning, again, pretty much taking it to failure versus ceasing sets with about four to six reps left in the tank. So short of failure. And this is what they called high repetitions in reserve training. And so they wanted to see if these two different training styles could differentially affect strength, hypertrophy, and some of the neuromuscular kind of performance characteristics. So again, resistance training males and females. I can see the average age here, weight, and then importantly, their average squat 1RM to body mass ratio was just over one and a half. So on average, most of the subjects in the study could squat uh, slightly over one and a half times their body weight, which again is usually a, a good indication that they were pretty well trained uh, and had a, a base kind of level of strength to start off with. And so again, they were allocated to these different groups and completed a five week training program uh, with the six set being kind of a deload week. This is just kind of a screenshot of some of the training that they did on days one, two, and three throughout the different weeks of this training program. Um, you can see the different specific exercises here. So for example, week one, day one, they were doing squat, deadlift, um, rear foot elevated split squat, RDL, face pull, and skull crushers. And so they were kind of, again, doing a full body training program three days a week over the course of five weeks, uh, slightly different again, depending on whether or not they were in the training of failure or not training of failure groups. 
And then if we get into the results here, uh, first, the authors just kind of highlighted some of the, the training volume and volume load um, results across the two different conditions. And so on a week to week basis, they didn't really see any difference across conditions for training volume, meaning they were doing fairly similar amounts of, of sets and reps. Overall, throughout the entire study and five week training program, there was a large effect observed in the training of failure group in which they likely performed more repetitions. And then again, just over that five weeks, that started to add up to the point where they were doing a higher training volume, which is somewhat expected, right? That is, again, the potential advantage of training of failure is you're likely completing more repetitions uh, throughout that training day and then likely throughout the duration of a program. And then again, you can see differences here in the average repetitions in reserve, uh, which again is intentional. This is kind of the way they split up their conditions. And so you would expect one group to have higher reps in reserve compared to the other. That means subjects were kind of following the instructions throughout that five-week training program. So again, this is what we would, in a sense, want to see or expect to see just the way they structured this training program. Now, importantly, they didn't see any condition by time interaction for squat, bench, or deadlift 1RM, meaning across those two conditions, depending on what group they were in, over time, after that five-week training program, one group didn't get stronger than the other for these three lifts. So whether they were in the training of failure group or um, non-training of failure group, they saw similar improvements in squat, bench, and deadlift. And so as we see here in this section, there were significant main effects of time for those three lifts. And what that means is over the course of time or over the course of this training program, both groups got stronger in those three lifts. However, the, the increases were, in a sense, equal across each condition or each training group. And so, again, that means the training program worked. Everyone in the study got stronger over the five weeks. So they saw improvements in those lifts. But again, they didn't really see any um, interactions, meaning the groups experienced the same level of increase uh, somewhat equally across those two groups or conditions, however you want to define those. And so some of the conclusions that we can draw from this is that these findings really kind of help us understand that in recreationally trained individuals, so prior um, you know, resistance training that they had been engaged in, uh, given that performing kind of a moderate to high resistance training load, so about 65 to 95% of their 1RM, again, using the, the training of failure or non-training of failure, it really promoted similar increases in strength. So, in a sense, there's not an advantage of training to failure um, in resistance trained individuals. And so, again, a couple things to, to consider here. The authors even mentioned this. Um, kind of based on findings from a, a similar study, they found that training of failure led to poor post-exercise recovery and worsened indices of muscle soreness and general feelings of well-being, again, which is kind of expected, right? So this means in individuals who train a failure, they often feel like garbage more compared to people who aren't training a failure because you're pushing yourself harder, right? You're, you're training uh, with more repetitions, you know, which again, is just going to lead to increased soreness, uh, fatigue and, and feeling on well. And that's important because if you feel like crap, but yet you're not getting that return on investment, meaning you're not getting stronger or, or experiencing uh, more muscle growth over time, then it's like, well, what's the point? Uh, right? So high repetitions in reserve training, meaning saving a few reps is seemingly an effective method for increasing strength and size over the course of five to six weeks. Whether or not this trend would continue over time, we don't really know based on this study. Uh, the other important thing I think is worth mentioning here is this is individuals just doing a strength training program. So with athletes who might be doing other sports specific things such as practice, conditioning, uh, agility, plyo type workouts, I would think this effect would even be uh, kind of more pronounced, meaning I would be more cautious of training a failure if you're also doing those other things, because I think it's just going to exacerbate those feelings of soreness and kind of feelings of unwell if you're doing all of those things and then also training a failure, especially if you're not getting that return on investment. So again, in my opinion, a really interesting study here. 
uh, very well designed, well executed, pretty practical findings that we can pull from it. Uh, and again, just kind of a word of caution there of people who always try to go full throttle every single time they're in the weight room. I'm going to follow this up with another research review in just kind of summarizing some uh, recent review articles on training for strength. And again, kind of coming back to this moral of the story of you, you don't need to be doing high volume, you know, reps to failure, um, a lot of like AM reps or as many reps as possible. If that's what your program looks like and you're training for strength, I would find a new coach or, or a new strength coach because it's definitely not the most effective way um, to be training if that's kind of the primary training goal.